1986, God brought me back to El Paso for the second time. Anybody ever leave and come back? It's like a, it's a sickness. You think you're going to escape, next thing you know, you're back. Um, it happened to me three times. Um, came back specifically to work with a group called the Watch Network that uh, was run by a very brave lady by the name of Sue Joyner, who previously had written a play on the book of Revelation that ran at the Civic Center to a packed house for two years. And, uh, and then God spoke to her and said she was supposed to do a screenplay on ritual abuse of children. And she said, I, I have no idea what that is. So she studied and found out, and all of a sudden she realized there was a whole world of children that were being injured by people who practiced the occult. I came to El Paso because I was looking to complete some answers for my own life, having grown up in that world. And I started working with them, and while I was getting healed of some of my own things that were residuals from my past, I got fast-tracked for the next 20 years doing law enforcement work. I trained law enforcement and criminal justice classes on occult-related crimes, and at some point we um, came across a couple of local cases that were not only related to the occult, but uh, it was related to organized uh, trafficking in children. And that was a whole other world. And uh, it was, I could probably write three books about everything that I went through. I met Josh and Nikki because I was involved with this little place called The Wayside. And uh, I had just gone through a period of time where I'd lost both parents. And I just, it's not that I wanted to quit ministry, I was just, needed some time to heal. So some of the kids from the wayside said, you ought to check out this really cool church. It's called St. Matthew's. And it's got this really cool youth pastor. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go hang out. So I went over there and uh, went to the youth group and then ended up going to the church and felt the presence of the Lord in one of the most powerful ways I'd felt in years. And I thought, this is where I want to just lay down my head for a couple of years. And um, so I laid down my head for 15 years. <laughs> uh, but my, um, if not my reputation, then whatever else was at work followed me and we uh, actually ended up having some very, very uh, ugly uh, demonic manifestations right there in the church. And thankfully the pastor was first on this, so we kind of tag teamed together to deal with it. Uh, but as you know, in the last few years, there's been a, a new emphasis on the human trafficking mm -hmm. situation, which I'm glad for. Uh, and I'm also alarmed by, in some ways. Um, and this is, I'm, I'll, I'll get to my testimony here in a minute, but this is very important to me because I realize most of the human trafficking ministries, which are so important, they are so important but they're dealing mainly with girls who are trafficked and brought into prostitution. And it's a horrible thing and we need to stop it. But you know what? It's the tip of the iceberg. And to the people who really, you have to realize this is a $35 billion a year industry in children, teens. And they are okay with letting some of these girls get extracted. Let's do it, we have to do it, because I'm for anything we need to do. But for the people that run the groups, they just consider it an acceptable business loss. And you can't imagine how deep this goes and how far it goes and how far up in the political world it goes and in Hollywood and in a thousand other places. And I find myself having to go back to work, not that I've ever really stopped, but. In the last six months, I've been aware that there are uh, groups around the city right now in an unprecedented way that are trafficking little children. And so let me just say this, just so you know, um, if you're in a restaurant and a child comes up to you and asks for money for a school project, it's going to usually be one of two things. It's going to be parents that are hooked on drugs sending their kids in to get drug money, or it's going to be cartels trafficking in children. The only way to know is to look the child in the face and say, what school do you go to? And if their eyes go glassy, you know that they're being trafficked. What do you do? Call 911. 
I have no guarantee they're gonna do anything. We've uncovered four situations like that just in the last three months. I spent the night of my birthday tracking one of these groups down at, from uh, Corner Bakery. So they're here, they're active. We need to pray for these little kids. We're talking seven, eight, nine-year-old children and it, it's absolutely heartbreaking. So my new crusade, if you want to call it, is to get that awareness into the eyes of people so they understand this is bigger than, than we, what we thought it was and we need to pray harder and we need to be more deliberate about how we're going to go about doing this. Now, somewhere along the way, I think it was like 94, 95, something like that, I was, I had pretty much healed up from everything that I went through when I was a kid. I mean, I was a walking blitzkrieg when I was a teenager. I had psychiatrists look me in the face and say, I can't help you. I'm sorry. I got passed around from Christian to Christian with like five or six different people who said, I can't help you, but here's somebody that can. And then I finally ended up in the hands of somebody that said, I can help you, and sat me down in a chair and cast demons out of me for nine hours, seven hours, something like that. Didn't work at all. It's trying to cast out my human problems, and they all came back. It's funny how that happened. So, um, but there have been a long time, even though God has been so gracious to me and healed so much, there were times when I was literally like, God, I do not understand why. I do not understand why I had to go through what I went through. I'm not trying to feel sorry for myself, but I just don't get it. There's things that happened to me I'll never be able to tell anybody about. There's things that happened to me I can't even remember that God has covered because it's so bad that I'd probably lose my mind if I remembered it. But that question is all already. Why, God? I don't understand why. A few years ago, I picked up the phone and I answered the phone and, and there was a 14 year old. And he says, my name is Mike. I said, what can I do for you? And he says, well, I was at the Century City Hotel with my parents and I was looking in the desk and I saw this book. I guess it's called a Bible. I've never seen anything. I've never seen one before. I said, really? He says, yeah. So I read a little, didn't really understand it, but I saw a number that says, if you need help, call the number. So I called the number, told them my story. They said, we can't help you, but here's a number, call them and they can help you. So I, this is sounding familiar. So he called somebody else and they said, well, we can't help you, we know somebody who can. So he called that number and says, we can't help you, but call this lawyer in Sacramento, California, he can help you. He called the lawyer and said, call this guy, he's from El Paso, his name's Greg Reed, I think maybe he can help you. He says, so oh, here I am, here's my story. And the story was long, I won't give you the whole story, but he was raised in a uh, demonic cult of what they call Druids, and it was multi-generational. And his grandfather had been murdered the year before, and he was to bypass his father's place and take his grandfather's place in this group. And they start tattooing him from his ankle when he was little, and they were about to finish the tattooing on the back of his neck to complete the training for him. And he says, I don't think you can help me, but if you can, tell me what to, do, what to do. I talked to him about Jesus. I told him a little bit about my background. We talked and he said, okay, I'll call you back. And then he called me two weeks later, told me some more short conversation. I said, I'll call you back. This happened five or six times. He finally called back and said, my name's not Mike, it's Lucas. And I thought, now he's, he can trust me. And we had long conversations for months and months and months. And sometimes he was just almost frantic because he knew there was no way out. Other times, he called me one time from a, a, a compound up in Eureka, California, where he was supposed to be in a ceremony that night and recite his entire lineage. And he said, if, they don't, if I don't get it right, they're gonna beat me. I need you to help me. So I'm trying to help him recite this. I mean, now, what do you do with something like this, right? And uh, I asked him to describe the place he was at, and sure enough, he was at one of the most high-level compounds for occult groups in the entire world. And he called me a few weeks later and he said, if I can tell you where they're gonna sacrifice a child and give you the exact space, place and time, you need to guarantee me you can get somebody there to stop it. Because if you can't, I'm not gonna tell you. But I'll give you all that information if you can assure me that someone's gonna stop it. I said, call me back in three days. I called every single department I possibly could. And I'd worked with a lot of departments. And 
they said, no, we don't know anything about that stuff, or no, we can't afford to do anything like that, or what are you talking about? There's no such thing as Satanism. People don't do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I dreaded the call when he called me back, and he finally said, you didn't find anybody, did you? I said, I am so, so sorry. And he said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but it looks like our God won this time. And I said, you know what, Lucas, I don't know what to tell you. You gotta tell somebody. You have to tell somebody. And he said, you know what it's like, man. You know what it's like. You've been there. You know, I can't tell anybody. You know what they do to me. You know what they do to my family. You know what it's like. And at that moment, it's like God stepped in and said, that's why I let you go through the things you went through. And I remember, I said, you know, I don't know what to do for you, but as God is my witness, if I could stand between you and them, I would. And it got quiet and I could tell he was crying. He said, you'd take a bullet from me? I said, in a split second. He said, no one's ever, but, ever said anything like that to me before. He said, I'm gonna keep calling you. I said, I don't want you to tell anybody about me. I'm gonna keep calling you. But if it comes a time when you don't hear from me for three or four months, maybe five months, you can tell whoever you want because I'll either be dead or I'll be so far in I can't get out. It's been almost 16 years since I've heard from him. So that continues to fuel my fire to help people to wake up, help people to pray. Not everybody can do what I do, but you can pray. The reason I actually got on all of this in the beginning is I grew up in Southern California, had two wonderful parents, you know, typical parents of the 30s. They went through hard times, didn't really know how to show a lot of affection, but they were always there. My dad was a cop. He was there most of the time. My mom was there all the time. But somehow, Southern California, I slipped through the cracks in our little community, which was and remains to this day one of the darkest places in the whole United States. It's a little area called Box Canyon. It's where Charlie Manson and his, his gang had their little compound. Nothing but pedophiles and druids and witches and warlocks and Satanists. And I was one of those children who slipped through the cracks. And I think I was very deliberately chosen because of my family, because of my bloodline, had a very heavy occult background, very heavy involvement in the Mormon church going back, you know, four or five generations. Somehow they got access to me. How? Back in the 50s and 60s, everybody trusted everybody. Mm -hmm. That's what you did. And somehow, something happened and I fell into their hands. And then began to be processed through, probably the, the part that was the easiest, believe it or not, was being forced to uh, be involved in having pictures taken for child pornography. That was the easiest part of what I went through. The other was going through rituals where I remembered jagged pieces of it being in a bonfire and people running, going around in a circle dancing with animal masks and chanting in another language. And at some point I went to a little church where I heard about Jesus. It was a front for the other people though. There was some good people in it and there were some real weird people in it. The pastor's son put us through a Sunday school class, little kids like me, nine, ten years old, where you he would uh, uh, light little smoke cubes that, that had green smoke and blue smoke and yellow smoke. And he would say, this yellow represents sickness and this blue represents life. And he'd go through all this and he said, this is what they did in Babylon. Now, I was 35 years old before I realized, hey, you know what? I don't think that was a regular Sunday school class they do in most churches. <laughs> but when you're little, you don't know that stuff. I just know it was getting darker and darker and I had periods of time where I just blanked out. But I made a friend at the church, or rather he made a friend with me. He was two or three years older than me. His name was Mark. We got to be friends. I was at his house. His parents were very strange. Lived in a very small, very run-down little house. Didn't like, look like he ever had much. But we came, became like best friends. And unfortunately, he was there when we went to some of these ceremonial things. I'm not sure how many, uh, because some of that is still not clear to me. 
the law was clear is on the winter solstice, I think it was 1963, 1964. My parents were unavailable because my mother got sick and nearly died in the hospital. And I was taken by some people from the church to the church Christmas party and taken from that Christmas party to Mark's house. It was his birthday, it was his 13th birthday. And at that point, after a little bit of ceremony, I remember him coming down all dressed in white and stuff. And they'd given us some punch and cookies. And the, after the punch, I started to feel dizzy. And I started to feel completely disoriented. And they were thrown in the back of the car, driven to some place. I think I pretty much located the place that it happened, where a rather large ritual ceremony t was taking place. And my friend uh, Mark was, uh, was killed and sacrificed. So my parents had returned to them a child that was completely shattered. Went from being a good church kid to highly sexualized, drinking, swearing, didn't care about anybody. They didn't know what to do. And what happened after that is I started to study the occult. And I started to practice the occult. And it became like an obsession. By the time I was 14, I was so deep in that that's all I wanted to do. I was recruiting other kids out of high school. I was gonna be somebody. Somewhere around 14, I was picked up by a hitchhiker and molested. And that was the moment at which I'll never forget getting out of the car, going over to a friend's house, taking a whole bottle of wine and drinking the whole thing in one setting and passing out. And I got up, she said, what's wrong? I said, I don't wanna to talk to you. The only thought I had in my head is God, if there's a God, there's nobody he could love me. If there's a God, he must hate me. If there's a God, I'm too evil. Or he'd never let this happen to me. And I found myself praying that somebody would pick me up who wasn't a molester, but a murderer and just end my pathetic little 14 year old life. Somewhere around that time, I remember going into a store and this nice little lady came up and handed me this little, little tiny Bible and said, God loves you. I said, thank you, put it in my back pocket, went home, read it, put it away, forgot about it. Went back to studying all the occult stuff. A few months later, I'm hitchhiking, here comes the guy in a little Volkswagen, picks me up and he says, I wanna tell you about Jesus. I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, whatever, you know. Just wanted to get away from this guy because yeah, I was evil, you know. I knew that, and I, my life was so far out of control. And I'm typical of somebody that was in that realm of the occult. I swore I'd never do anything bad. I'm never gonna do anything bad. I'm gonna do good stuff. I can do, you know, seances and cards and all this stuff. I'm not gonna do bad stuff. And one night I verbally cursed somebody and that night they were shot to death. Now, did I have anything to do with that? Probably not, but it convinced me that I had crossed over to the dark side and I could never come back. So after that first guy picked me up about six months later, I'm hitchhiking and here comes another Volkswagen. I'm like, what do they manufacture this for preachers out of Detroit or something? <laughs> you know, this guy picks me up and says, I wanna tell you about Jesus, son. I said, yeah, I, I know about Jesus. And he said, no, you don't understand. I live in Manhattan Beach, that's 45 miles from here. God woke me up this morning and said to drive out here and be at the exact corner of Topanga Canyon and Valley Circle and there'd be a young boy on the, on the street corner house to pick you up and tell you that Jesus loves you. And I had two thoughts. One was, God can't love me, I'm too evil. The other was, what if? That started to unend uh, up in my world. Shortly after that, I was hitchhiking with one of the last friends I had because I scared everybody else off. The guy picks us up in a big, you remember LTDs, those big old clunker cars? I thought, good, it's not one of those crazy Christians. <laughs> he was worse, he was a crazy charismatic that went to church like six times a week, whether he needed to or not. And my friend's in the front seat, and he's an atheist, and they're just talk he's talking, he's saying, we have this really cool Bible study where we get together and rap about God. I'm like, oh yeah, that's how I want to spend my Friday nights, you know. <laughs> um, we got out of the car and went to my friend's girlfriend's house. She was there, and he said, why don't we go to this? It might be fun. I'm like, okay, you're the one that said, 
So we went in and it was just a house full of Christians and they were young and old and singing all these songs I'd never heard in church. It was powerful. I was scared to death. And they had this place where this guy, David Malkin, got up and said, this is how you receive Jesus. Just bow your head. So I bowed my head and I just blanked out. But I did, when it came time for people to raise their hand, I did look up and I saw my friend raise his hand to receive Jesus. Now I was totally freaked out. And on the way home, this guy and my friend are talking like they've known each other their whole lives. And I had two reactions. One was, I'm really happy for him because he never had anything. You know, his mom had been married six times before he was 10 years old. She just beat him half to death most of the time. And the other thought I had was total sadness because I thought, I can't go with him. He's crossed over a river and I can't go. This guy gave us two books when we got out of the car. One was called Good News for Modern Man. It was a Bible. Another one was called Crossing the Switchblade by David, David Wilkerson. I put them away, continued to do my stuff, but now my life was in complete turmoil because now my other friend was a Christian and I'm just in this total darkness. I'd look in the mirror and I'd see someone else looking back at me. I knew that I was gone, that this everything had taken over. My parents went on a little business trip and I went with them. I had a little separate hotel room and I brought this book, The Cross and the Switchblade. And I got to a part in the book where David Wilkerson faced down the most powerful gang leader in New York. Uh, Nikki Cruz went down to his little gang den and said, Nikki, Jesus loves you. And Nikki's response was to pummel him until he bled and said, what do you think about that preacher? And David said, Nikki, you can cut me up in a thousand pieces. Every piece is going to scream out, Jesus loves you. I picked up the book and I threw it against the wall. I said, why didn't anybody ever tell me God had this kind of power? Why didn't anybody ever tell me God could love somebody like that, like me? I went home that night. We got home late at night. I lay down in bed and I looked up and I said, Buddha, Jesus, Mohammed, I don't know if there's anybody there at all, but if there's anybody there, please help me because I don't want to live anymore. I can't do this anymore. And I can say like Paul, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't say. But as God is my witness, I went from that short prayer to being taken somewhere where I was in an open field and was like nobody was around in the whole universe. And I felt every bit of agony and pain and abuse and hurt in that one second. And I began to just wail and scream like a wounded lion. Just, And I, I looked up in the sky and I saw Jesus on the clouds and he was reaching out to me like this. And I screamed at him. I said, I can't reach you. You're too far away. And at that moment, I was taken off of the ground and hurtled through time, space. I can't even tell you where I went or what, how that happened. But the next thing you know, I was being cradled in the arms of Jesus Christ. I felt loved for the first time in my life. And all of a sudden, I'm back in my bed. Tears streaming down my face. I said, tell me what to do. I didn't know what to do. So I just walked out in the woods, I'd say, look, I'm not very good at the these and thou stuff. I'm sorry, but how about I just talk to you like you're my friend because that's all I know how to do. That's how I started praying. That's how I still pray because he is that. Then one July night, everybody's looking forward to seeing the astronauts walk on the moon. There, I just aged myself. I'm gonna to get together with a few friends I had left and party and watch that. Instead, I find this guy's card in my wallet and I pick it up, his name was Ted. I said, hey Ted, this is Greg. He says, I have been waiting for you to call me. I said, you know what, you're just really weird. I'm sorry, but yeah, what do you mean? He says, I put a poster up by your house and prayed over it and I asked Jesus to have you call me and here you are. So you're coming tonight, right? I said, nope. But thanks for asking, maybe another time. I hung up the phone, I said, we're gonna to go to a prayer meeting tonight. 
So we watched the little moon landing. Next thing you know, we're in a car. We go in this little house. Same house as any year before, six months before. Everything inside of me is screaming not to go in there. Everything inside of me is screaming, stop, don't go into that place. I managed to get in the front door. I sat right by the front door because I was going to run the first chance I had. It was the same thing. All these people talking about Jesus like he was real. Like he healed their marriages or he healed somebody from cancer. Kids and adults and older people, younger people. And they're singing these songs and I could just feel this presence that was different than anything I'd ever felt. Here comes the moment of truth. Dave Malkin. May his memory be blessed, this little tiny guy, landscaper that decided he got saved, spirit-filled, decided he was going to invite people in and talk about Jesus. So he got up and he said, becoming a Christian is the easiest thing you'll ever do. So simple and easy, most people just trip right over it. It won't cost you anything, just your life. I remember thinking, I don't really even have a life to give to God. And why would he want it anyway? He said, everybody, bow your head, close your eyes. It's very simple. This is how it's going to happen. If you want to receive Jesus tonight, just raise your hand. Everything inside of me was screaming, you are not going to raise your hand. You are not going to do this. Because everything they had infected with in me my whole life was screaming out. Every demonic force was saying, you're not going to do and I started, I wanted to raise my hand, but it was shaking. I couldn't lift. It was like this billion pound weight on my arm. And now inside I'm just saying, please, God, please, God, because I'm feeling like this is my last chance. And a girl from the other side of the room, she said, you know, I feel like God has told me there's somebody here that wants to raise their hand, but they feel like there's a thousand pound weight on it. If you lift your hand right now, God's going to let you do it. And all of a sudden, bam, that thing broke. And I raised my hand, and Dave led everybody in prayer of salvation, and I prayed such a simple prayer. You know, people criticize this and say, this simple prayers don't work. You know, it's not real salvation. I say, this is how I got into the kingdom of God. I said, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Jesus, come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and make me into the person you want me to be. Amen. And when I said that prayer, it was like grabbing a hold of a lightning bolt. And I got the power of God came through me, rushing through me, like just nothing. Nothing you can believe in, just wave upon wave upon wave of the power of God and the love of God, and just washing out all the junk and all the junk and all the junk and all the junk. I got up, my other friend that I brought was got saved, and we we're laughing and hugging each other and crying like idiots. And you know, on the way home, I'm leaning out the window and screaming at people, Jesus loves you. I got home that night and I laid down in bed and I said, Jesus, please let this be real. This is the most real thing I've ever known, but I've known so much stuff that isn't real on the other side. Please let it be real. And I woke up the next morning and looked out the window. And I was like, I saw color for the first time in my life. Took my Bible to school. Lost every friend I ever had. Both of them. My best friend from grade school spit on me and said, get away from me, you Jesus freak. I just remember thinking, I like this book. There's something to this book. Now I'd like to tell you that the road from there was easy. It was not. I'd been totally brainwashed by the occult. I was so brainwashed that we had a Bible study one week. The next week I brought a Ouija board because I thought, well, we studied the Bible last week. Let's play the Ouija board this week. They kind of kicked me out. I said, get this demon-possessed thing out of here. I don't know if they were talking about the board or me or both, but anyway, I got really mad. Devil wasn't going to let go too easy. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, unfortunately. Let me just say that God brought me through to a moment of truth where my friend David that ran those meetings sat down with me and he pointed at verse after verse after verse. No, Greg, there's no other way to get saved except through Jesus. No, Greg, heaven and hell are real. No, Greg, Jesus is the only way to God. He went through all these verses. And I went home and I challenged God. I said, I need to know the truth. Is all, is everything a lie that I've ever known? And God showed me 100% 
irretrievably that it was all a lie. And when I found out, I went home and I took every single occult book and amulet and card reading and everything and I put it in the fire and just watched it burn and watched the weight lift. And from that moment on, I never went back, not for one second, not to touch, not interested, don't care. You know why? Because I know where the real power is. I know who has the real power. And I regret that I have to close and I have to go, but let me just tell you something. Everything after Jesus was like icing on the cake for me. Everything, every moment after that, because I really did know what it was like to be in the darkest, darkest pits, right down there, nothing but a kid that was just wrapped with demons and darkness and pain. And Jesus took me because he loved me. And he washed me. And he, he made me his own. What else do I need? I don't need a new house, new car, fame, fortune, any of that stuff. I don't care about that stuff. I have Jesus. And when you have Jesus, you've got two things. You've got that, you've got everything in him. But also, you may not have all the answers to all your pain, to all your suffering, to all your struggles, but he does. And if you trust him, trust me, after all these years of walking with him, I can tell you, God truly is at work in all things to produce good. The good, the bad, and the ugly because he loves you. Yeah, thank you for letting me share that. Yeah, go ahead. Did you write the book or did Sue? Is there a book about your life? There is. I did write that book, Nobody's Angel. Yeah. I found it in my house and I have no idea how it got there and read it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you bring some of your books? I didn't bring. They're all, they're all out for now. But oh. Let's see if I can get some in. You all would be interested. I'd be glad to share them with you. So, thank you. Thank you so much. I get my number. I got to run back to the house. Would you just say a quick prayer? Yeah, I would. Sure. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, God, for everybody that's come here, Lord, to to just know more about you. I thank you, Jesus, that there is no pit that's so deep that you're not deeper. I pray for everybody, God, whose heart's hurting tonight, who's struggling and feels lost and alone and without help. You are a very present help in time of trouble, God. Thank you for this place. Thank you for what Josh and Nikki are doing, God. And I pray your, your, your healing power, God, will just rest here and bring everybody here into a place of healing. In Jesus' name, amen.